your body. Use me as your vessel for your glory, honor, and praise. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. This morning I want to, in a sense, continue our study that we last left off on, which was church discipline. And um, in that last study we spent some time looking at the care of the shepherd for his sheep. And just as a reminder, we were in Matthew 18, so if you want to turn there, <clears throat> we're going to bounce around to several different passages in the Bible this morning, uh, but that's, that's going to be our launching point for the lesson. So in Matthew chapter 18, we saw <clears throat> Jesus care for those that came to him as little children, and we saw his care for those that had come to him and who he now called sheep. They were in his fold, and they were those that he loved. Those little children coming unto him, he said, if you offend one of them, it would be better for you to have a millstone hanged about your neck, be cast into the sea, and drowned. <clears throat> and those that are his sheep, when one goes astray, what does he do? He goes after it, and he rescues it. So I... <clears throat> In light of that, with that understanding and that foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ's care for the ones that are coming unto him and those that are called his sheep, <clears throat> with that backdrop, he begins to explain to the disciples, and we won't fully relay the foundation of what we studied previously, but I think it's good just to bring it before your memory. With that backdrop, he begins to explain to his disciples how the sheep are protected provided for and cared for properly while in the fold. And he does that by laying out the principle and the practice of church discipline. We took special care to expound the verses from chapter 18 and verse 15 <clears throat> through 20. And if you don't understand church discipline and you missed that lesson, then I encourage you to go back and listen to it. And if you don't understand church discipline and you were in that lesson... Let me know if I can do any better at communicating to you. Or maybe you just had other things on your mind that morning. But regardless, I think that this is important for us. And we saw the purpose of church discipline was twofold. Now, number one, it is for restoration. And number two, it is for purification. The number one goal of church discipline is always restoration. We are not just walking around lobbing off heads, trying to get people to toe the line that we want. We are to be peaceable and loving and kind and gentle. We are to consider ourselves when we're addressing somebody who's got a fault. Because wouldn't you know that the easiest time for us to stumble is that moment in which we think we have the best footing. Because what we've done is we've established ourselves as like, oh, I've done what is right. And right then, where are, where are our eyes directed? We are proud and our head is lifted up. You take that next step and you don't realize that there is a step down there. We've got to be very careful of that. So restoration's goal, the restoration is always the primary goal of church discipline. Or, excuse me, not the primary goal, but the first purpose of church discipline is restoration. The second purpose of church discipline is purification. That does not mean that there is no sin in the body. That does not mean that um, you all are here and you all are just perfect and happy and delightsome and all those things. Um, some of you came into this auditorium this morning and you're broken. And you're begging God. You're pleading with God to give you something today. And that's good. That's the position you need to be in if you're broken. But there will be sin. But purification by that, what we mean is that there is no open, unrepentant sin that is not confronted in the body. If you see me out openly sinning, or if I sin privately between me and you, what do you need to do? You need to get on Facebook 
and you need to light me up in some vague attached thing where you don't name me, but you make it pretty clear it's got to be one of these three people. I mean, that's the way to do it, right? Garbage. No, you go to me. Come to me, tell me. Have I offended you? Uh, this is open challenge right now. I mean, not at this moment. Don't let me finish first. <laughs> but right now, if I've offended you, I mean it. Come to me. I'm not mad. I won't be mad. Show me where I've offended you. Show me where I have hurt you, where I've wronged you, where I, I may have sinned against you. And that should be all of our hearts. It's not always easy to be confronted when we have sinned, right? We immediately get defensive because we think that we are something when we are nothing. But we need to be open and desirous not only that others would be pure, but that we would be pure. So many times we say, if so-and-so would get their life together, they'd quit ruining mine. If you had a right perspective of who was on the throne, you wouldn't worry about so-and-so. But if they've sinned against you, you need to take care of that. You don't want a root of bitterness. Purification. So the number one goal of church discipline is to restore those saints who are acting in contradiction to what they are professing. And in plainer words, they are not loving the brethren. And that is evidenced by their sin. If you're not loving the brethren, you're sinning against the brethren. If you have someone in here that you do not love in the bowels of your mercies and your compassion, it is because you have sinned. Or they have sinned against you. And now you are not reciprocating what you should be giving to them, which is loving them and entreating them, praying for them. John records the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 13, verse 35. You don't have to turn there. We're just going to hit it quickly. And here the Lord says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And the kind of love that he is talking about is the love in action. It's a love that is a love in action. Not just a kind of superficial, I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. Some of y'all just had scary flashbacks of a dinosaur. It's a real genuine love that is both effectual in mind and emotion. In mind and in motion. I want you to consider this. The Bible instructs men to love their wives as Christ loved the church, right? Does that mean that men just don't love their wives as Christ loved the church? Or does that mean that men need to take special care for that labor? It doesn't mean we can't. It doesn't mean that some men just don't naturally. It means that our natural affection is to be drawn to other things because we are visual creatures and we're foolish. And we're battling the flesh. And so we need to pinpoint... I mean, we, put, we need to put a target on our wives. Not for abuse, not for blame, but for love. I mean, we need to light them up like the 4th of July with love. And likewise, women, naturally, women are so willing to listen to other men before they listen to their husband. Not all women, but generally, that is the case. And so it says, wives, submit to your own husbands. You need to have a desire in your heart and in your mind, and you need to set forth to do that which God has commanded you. Husbands, light your wives up with love. Wives, set your affection toward your husband in such a way that when he instructs you in a godly manner, you pursue the fulfillment of that instruction. Now, that's not politically correct because there's no reason for men to instruct women in these days... Because if you watch television, we've talked about this before, you already know that the men are the, just idiots, drunks, slobs, and fools. And the women are the ones who are tough and in charge and powerful and warriors. Ain't nothing wrong with women. I love women, in particular my wife. But I love all women in general. But we need to remember that order as we've talked about before. This love is a love that is an active love, though. 
Let's get back to this. Paul describes this kind of love in that familiar passage in 1 Corinthians. You all know this. He calls it charity. That's what the Bible word for this kind of love is, that agape love. Charity. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Some of you think that you're enduring some of the people that sit on the pews of these churches on occasion, but are you really? Some of you think that you're bearing the burden of loving a, a brother or sister in Christ that maybe has offended you, but are you really? Love in action, love in action this kind of love keeps us in the joy of our fellowship. But when sin comes in and it will, what does it do? Say it. It divides. Sin brings forth what? Death. Sin stops what? Fruit. Sin brings what? Shame. Not just to yourself, but to the name and the glory and the honor of the precious Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Sin will come in. And when it comes, God gives us church discipline. The Lord Jesus Christ gives us church discipline for restoration, but when the means given by the Lord for restoration are rejected and they are refused by those who are in sin, the second purpose of church discipline, which is purification, steps up. I want you to think about this. I don't think, I don't know, but I don't think that we have anything like this in this church. And if we did, I would think that I would know because this is called something commonly known, commonly reported. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, you have the issue of the young man who has taken his father's wife. How awful a thing. A sin which was not even so named among the Gentiles. <clears throat> and in verse... 11, Paul instructs the congregation this way about this unchecked sin in the church. But now I have written unto you to keep... But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be what? A fornicator. Be what? Or covetous. Or idolater. Or a railer. Or a drunkard. Or an extortioner. With such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. But them that are without God judges. Note what he says here. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So what does that tell you about a brother and sister in Christ? If they're called a brother in verse number 11, in verse number 13 they can be called what? A wicked person. Now, I think just about everybody in here, if you've been saved long enough, you could raise your hand and say, I've fallen into the category of a brother or a sister that is, has been a wicked person. So what do we do about it? What is so often the result of somebody getting in sin and then we don't disfellowship them, eventually they disfellowship themselves. And what do they do? They go about their process of life and they go through that period of their life where they're out serving sin and they're in the bondage of sin and then all of a sudden the Holy Ghost comes and He rains down conviction on them. The chastisement of the Spirit of God comes if they are sons and, or, and, sons and daughters and not bastards. And then all of a sudden the Holy Ghost is just working on them and they say, I've got to get back to church. But how often do they go back to the church that they left? Not very often. Very often the shame is too prevalent because the church is put on blinders and we have said we will not confront sin in the church. It is too uncomfortable. 
It is too inconvenient. You cannot grow a church through church discipline. We already dealt with that in the first lesson. You go back and watch that if you don't believe me because that's exactly how the church was grown in the book of Acts. That's exactly how churches are grown today. Through a healthy practice of church discipline. But what we have done is we have turned the church into what? A hospital for sinners. Now you all have heard that phrase, right? A hospital for sinners. For sinners, but the primary function of the church is not to serve sinners. Now, I'm not saying that you should not invite people to church that are lost. I am not saying that lost people are not welcome at Temple Baptist Church. By no means am I saying that. What I am saying is that the primary function of the body of Christ in the assembling of the saints is not to serve sinners. It is to serve the saints. When a man stands behind this pulpit to teach in Sunday school, he is not trying to tickle the ear of lost people and get them interested in churchianity or in Christianity or in the Bible. He is trying to instruct the saints of the living God. I'm here with a broken heart and a great concern for my church. I love lost people. I do street evangelism. I do personal witnessing outside of street evangelism. I, I love them. But when I am in the assembly of the saints, I am not here for lost people. I'm here for you who are in Christ Jesus. But what have we done? Let me skip around here. Paul is not looking to establish a social club, but he is seeking a Christ-exalting assembly of the body of Christ. He is seeking to present us as a chaste virgin before the Lord Jesus Christ. But the world, the flesh, and the devil will pursue the absolute destruction of the church. And do you know what the first point that they hit is? It's not the weak saint. It's not the one who is sitting there quietly on the pew. It is the man of God who stands behind the pulpit. It is the ones who are in the position of teaching and preaching. Those are the ones that if they can bring them down, what will it do? It will bring the most dishonor to Christ. It will bring the most shame to that assembly. It will bring the most dishonor and shame and blasphemy against God. Now, yes, when we as church members outside of the position of preachers and teachers sin, what does it say about the women in Titus? The women who are not doing what the women are instructed to do in Titus, it says that they are, blas they are causing, giving cause for the blaspheming of God's name. And men, likewise, when we don't do what we're supposed to do, we are giving cause for others who are lost to blaspheme God's name because our sin is demonstrating to them that there's something wrong with our faith. But God hath before ordained good works that we should walk therein. Why? So that people may see our good deeds and glorify who? Well, us, of course. No, our Father which is in heaven. We should have an unrelentless, we should have a relentless pursuit of good works. We should have a relentless pursuit of purification. And church discipline is a means by which we can have purification. But here's what I want to get to the crux of the matter. And that is Paul's concern. What is Paul's concern first and foremost when it comes to church discipline? What was Paul's greatest fear? Paul describes the work of a pastor and a teacher as being for the perfecting and maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It is the work of the body, both preachers and pew sitters call sinners to Christ. 
But it is pastors and teachers who are the most accountable people in a church. We are all accountable before God to present the gospel, to proclaim the message of Christ, to proclaim uh, repentance and faith toward uh, repentance toward God, faith toward Christ, as Paul says in Acts chapter twenty, which we're going to touch in just a second. It is absolutely everyone's responsibility to do that, but it is not everyone in this church's responsibility to be a pastor or a teacher. So, what is Paul's primary concern if? If the biggest thing that the world and the flesh and the devil want to do is disrupt the work of Christ, the work of the church, of the the very being of the church, if he could destroy the church and and blow it out of this uh, cosmos that God has created, he would absolutely do it. And how would he do it? By attacking the leadership. Or by installing false leadership. You know what the judgment of God on this nation has been? It has not been Barack Obama. The judgment of God on this nation is not Joe Biden. That might feel that way. That's not what it is. It's Joel Osteen. It's Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin and... It's it's men who will stand and they will tell you everything they can to get you in the seat so that they can get your wallet open. I I read a news article recently. I saw a headline on a news article recently where a pastor was berating his church for not buying him an expensive watch. Accosting his congregation for not forking over the money for a nice watch. That is the judgment of God on the church today, on America today, excuse me, and on the church. He wants to disrupt leadership. So with that, we turn to Paul and his concern for the leadership of the church, Acts chapter 20, if you will. That was a good long introduction to get us to this point where we are supposed to be today. And in Acts chapter 20, we're just going to run through a couple of things briefly, and then we're going to look specifically at some things. Acts chapter 20, Paul calls a meeting with the elders of Ephesus while he's on his way back to Antioch from his third missionary journey. And what is on the heart of Paul? Paul bears his heart before them. Now, now think about this. Paul had picked up Timothy along the way on his, what was it, second missionary journey. He had picked up that young convert, Timothy, and brought him all the way along on that second missionary journey, which was, I think, about three years and over 2,700 miles. And as they are walking and walking and riding on ships and walking and all of this, Paul is doing the work of an apostle. He's doing the work of an evangelist. He's doing the work of a pastor. He's doing the work of a teacher. And Timothy gets to see all of this. Now, I want you to keep that in the backdrop of your mind as we go forward. And so, with that, he stopped at Ephesus. And he was not able to stay long at Ephesus that first stop. But he promised them that he would be back soon. And then on on his other missionary journey, when he stops at Ephesus, he stays there for over three years. And he ministers with those at Ephesus. And now he's on his way back. And he calls for the elders to come to Miletus. The elders in Ephesus to come to Miletus. And he desires that they would come there so that he can see them one last time face to face. Because at this time he will tell them, you will no longer see my face. I'm going to die. You won't be seeing me except in glory. And what are his last words face to face with the men in charge of Ephesus? The men who are the leadership at the church at Ephesus. We'll just hit this briefly. In verse 18, we see his conversation among the Ephesians. Another way, his conduct. Um, In verse 19, we see his commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In verse 20, 21, 26, and 27, we see the completeness of his preaching. He said that he, uh, he forsook not to declare the whole counsel of God to them. And in verse 22 through 25, we see his confidence in the purpose of God in his life. In other words, he counts everything lost for the excellency of gaining Christ. For the beauty of Jesus Christ, for the glory of Jesus Christ, he says, I have pure confidence in God for his purpose in my life. I would not rather be back in a pharisaical position. I would not rather be back there in an authority position with the Jews where I am in a place of privilege and power, yet I am lost and undone. Why would you trade that? What would a man give for his soul? Now, remember the work of Paul in Ephesus. We'll hit this quickly. In Ephesus, God, God wrought special miracles by Paul. That's in chapter 19 and verse 11. In Ephesus, God confirmed the ministry of Paul while confounding the sons of Sceva. That's in verse 13 through 16 of chapter 19. The evil spirit said unto the sons of Sceva, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? In Ephesus, God used Paul to bring fear on all the people that the name of Jesus Christ would be magnified. In Ephesus, God turned the hearts of those who had been converted and had not yet abandoned all of their mystical arts and their books. And he brought them together, they brought them together and burned them before all the city. And by this, it says the word of God grew and prevailed. That's Acts 19, 19 through 20. And in Ephesus, God used Paul to bring many souls to Christ. Some would say that Ephesus had unparalleled testimony during the over three-year stay of the Apostle Paul and his companions. That Ephesus had so much light that Paul could not flippantly, but confidently and happily say that I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul could not say that with absolute certainty, I don't think, to every single place he visited because every single place he visited did not get three years of the Apostle Paul there ministering day in and day out, night in and night out. And we know that Paul preaches long because he preaches so long that some people fall over and die. My wife said it is not a competition to be like the Apostle Paul. So I checked that clock. But in spite of this mighty work of God, Paul does not expect that they will be any different from the children of Israel. So in Miletus, he calls the elders down, and there he tells them that they will never see his face again, and he leaves them with this warning before they clutch each other, and they weep, and they are in sorrow and sadness because they will not see Paul again. He warns them and he says, Acts 20 and verse 28. Look with me there. Remember, we're talking about church discipline. Accountable leadership. If I had to title it, usually give that at the beginning. Church discipline, accountable leadership. Take heed therefore unto yourselves. This is the exact opposite of what man does. In the Garden of Eden, Lord, the woman thou hast given me. Was Adam deceived? But Eve was deceived. But Adam's testimony is, Lord, the woman thou hast given me. God says to Adam there, take heed unto yourself. And to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. He immediately establishes there through verses 18 and all the way up to 27 his work and God's confirmation of all of his work and his conviction, his commitment. All of those things are there. And now he says, guess what? This ain't for Paul. This is for God. Paul did not purchase you. God purchased you with his own blood. 
For I know this. This was not something that Paul thought was a possibility. This is something that Paul knew was imminent. And it demanded their attention. That after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Not just people from without, but people from within. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day cheerfully. No, in tears. His heart was broken. It wasn't just that this was a warning that was new to them. It was that for three years, the space of three years, he had warned them night and day with tears. People are going to come and they are going to try and subvert the truth of the gospel. And they're going to try and lead you into another gospel. They're going to try and get you to receive another spirit. They're going to try and get you to receive all kinds of things. Be warned. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Paul is not looking, as I said earlier, to establish a social club, but an exalting assembly of the body of Christ. But Satan desired to sift Peter as wheat. Is that correct? And I would say that we live in one of the most sifted generations of the church that has ever been because the leadership is not what it ought to be. We look at church history and we say, man, they were awful holier than thou. Man, they were awful pious. Man, they were awful. Th man, th their liturgy, their, the way that they conducted their services, it was so like rigorous in many cases. If you look at the Didache and it explains a little bit about the church services and, and then you look at one of the early church fathers, he talks about a church service and it seems, I mean, there's freedom there but it seems a little bit rigid. It seems like it was very, very purposeful, I should say. But what we have this day is what Charles Spurgeon warned about. Charles said, a time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. Pastor Lawson, in a sermon from 2013 entitled Cafeteria Christianity, spoke of the arrogance of men and women who cherry-pick preferred doctrines from the Bible. So you have a little bit of both. You have Charles Spurgeon's Statement fulfilled, and you have Pastor Lawson's statement fulfilled. I wouldn't say they were prophesying, but I'll tell you what, they got wisdom beyond everything that I can imagine. He talked about the fact that cafeteria Christianity is this idea that, you know, well, I'll choose a little bit of this, and I'll take a little bit of that, and yeah, I'll, oh, I'll have some of this. and I'll Is that not what we have today when we will not adhere to everything that the Bible has commanded us to do? Paul, he says, I've preached the whole counsel of God. Take heed to yourselves because wolves are without and perverse speakers will arise from within. It is, so it is imperative, it is absolutely necessary to maintain accountability amongst yourselves as leadership. You all need to look to yourselves, but not only that, but you need to be correctable by the sheep. I have had people come to me after I've preached and said, hey, you said this. And I don't know if that's right. And there have been occasions when those people have been right and I was wrong. Amen? But more than that, like I said at the beginning of the lesson, I should be correctable in every aspect. I should not force people to bend the knee to the whims of Caleb Wilson, but I should bend my knee to the words of the living God. It's necessary to maintain accountability for leadership. And in this study, we will see what qualifies a man for the office of a bishop. Now, we're not going to get to all of it today, but we're going to dive a little bit into it. 
What are the guidelines by which he must be held accountable? What are the things that establish a man for the work of a pastor, of a teacher? Now, we don't generally follow the, the order of some churches and some denominations. But if you're teaching and preaching regularly in this church, you are by default an elder. Which scares me to death because that makes me even more accountable than I ever would be not standing here. That makes me more watchful of what I say and do from this pulpit and what I say and do from without this pulpit. Because, was it James that says, Be not many masters, knowing that we shall reap the greater condemnation? I think that was James. It might have been John. I think it was James. So it is important that we understand what a biblical elder is, what a biblical pastor or teacher is. And we are able to hold that one accountable. I will say this, that there are many people who disagree with certain points that we're going to hit today. And there are good people on both sides of the argument for some of these points. But in general, we must submit ourselves to what is outlined by Scripture as far as what qualifies someone to teach and preach in the church of the living God. Now, I want you to note this. When Paul went to Ephesus, what did he do? He went first where? Where did he? Oh, come on. He, you know where he went first. Where did Paul always go first? Romans chapter 11. Who did he love? Say it loud. I'm deaf. The synagogue, right? To the Jews. Paul always went where? To the synagogue. I want to make you all interact. Why did he go there? Well, it's one of three reasons. One, it's because he knew that he would have a platform there. Number two, it's because, probably because, well, he understood everything where they came from. And number three, it's because he loved them. So number one, he knew he'd have a platform there. If he walked in there being Saul of Tarsus to most of them, what would they see? They would see him likely in his garments that would be worn by a rabbi. And so he walks in there as the Lord Jesus Christ walking around as a rabbi and he goes into a synagogue and they say, oh, come and tell us something. He knew he'd have a platform. Number two, he knew how to start off with the Jews. How did Paul always start off with the Jews? He always started off with men and brethren. Come on, you all children of the living God. He set them up real good for a grand slam. And he told them all about God's mighty acts as he chose Israel and how important Israel was. And then he says, and God de declared that he would give a redeemer and there's a promise and Jesus Christ is that promised seed. And then the controversy would start. It was all all right till then. But Paul knew he had an end. And it was so important that he went there and he declared. But in the church of the living God, I want you to know this, that we do not allow people who declare themselves to be preachers and teachers come up or rabbis or anything like that or sages come up and just say, oh, well, would you like to take the pulpit? That is something that was done in Israel. But in the church of the living God... Christ has a desire to protect the body and he requires something of those who instruct the body. He is not loose in his requirements. So turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're not going to get far. We've got five minutes left. But I want to put this before your reading and we are going to, on our next time together, we are going to struggle through this maybe. Because there are some controversies here in this passage. We're going to hit them head on, and we're going to deal with them graciously, though. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 
verse number one, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. That is what is required of a bishop. That is what qualifies a man to stand and preach and teach the Word of God. Is he required to be perfect in all of these points? No. Absolutely not. Because then we would not have any pastors or teachers. But this is required to be the pattern of his life. This is what we should examine when I stand up here. When anybody else stands up here, I thank God that we have a pastor who has practiced a life in which we can see this. I thank God that we have a pastor who has humbled himself under the mighty hand of God and been exalted in due time. And I pray with every ounce and fiber of being within me that I could be half the man that our pastor has been. Whether I'm serving here or somewhere else. But regardless of what I want, regardless of what anybody wants, if a man does not meet these qualifications, he is unqualified. Let me give you a brief example of what the danger of an unqualified bishop leads to. An unqualified bishop is a man, and I'm going to name names. People get on to me sometimes about naming names and dropping names. I think most of y'all are like, amen. But some people don't like it. There's a man, I think he's in North Carolina, at Elevation Church. You may or may not have heard of him. If you're on the internet at all and you look at religious videos on YouTube, eventually this guy's going to pop up. Or if you look at religious groups or thing, activities like that on the Facebook or the Twitter or anything like that, this guy's going to pop up. But he's the pastor of Elevation Church, I think in North Carolina somewhere. His name's Stephen Furtick. The man is unqualified. In, in one of the earliest videos of this man, he stands up before his congregation. And he says, if you have been saved, if you've accepted Jesus into your heart, and you are now a Christian, Elevation Church is no longer for you. Go find yourself another church. Elevation Church's only purpose is to see people saved. You want to get fed? Go somewhere else. He's an unqualified, too quickly elevated novice, being lifted up with pride. He's fallen into the, he's fallen into the condemnation of the devil. We need to check leadership. I don't know what the future holds for Temple Baptist Church for certain. But as long as God has me serving here, I pray to God that I will never have weak people sitting in the pews before me who will not check me. When a man stands up and he, and he teaches doctrine like Stephen Furtick, modalism, 
that God is the Father at times and He is the Son at other times and He is the Holy Ghost at other times when He teaches a doctrine like man are little gods and God begets God and, and He defames the name of God Almighty, Jehovah, lifted on high, the one that is exalted, the Holy One. And He says, you know, horses beget horses just like Creflo Dollar. You know, and cats beget cats. When the Godhead gets together and He begets Man, what's he doing when he equates a sexual act of a beast with that of the Godhead creating mankind? When they are willing to say that health, wealth, and prosperity is the gospel? If, if, if I ever stand before a congregation that is not willing to throw a red back hymnal right at my forehead because of false doctrine or some sin in my life, then I pray to God that I would just fall over dead. Leadership must be held accountable. The Baptist Church is going through, the Southern Baptist Convention is going through a struggle right now where they have hidden and they have uh, uh, set aside abuse in their churches. If there's abuse in a church, it needs to be hit head on, especially when it comes from the leadership. We must submit to God. Church discipline is not only that which happens amongst the believer sitting on the pew, but it is that which happens in the appointment and the continued accountability of those who lead the congregation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you and we glorify your name that you have set forth these biblical standards that help protect, that help preserve and purify your body. I pray now, God, that you would give us wisdom as a congregation as we continue this study, the next time that it is appointed to us, God, that we would see your glory and what all is being said, that, God, we are not about elevating men, but we are about elevating your name. We ask it all be done now in Christ's name. I pray that you would touch the preaching that follows. God, give it unction power. Give it something that can't be uh, worked up in the flesh, but, God, something that comes from the Holy Ghost. We ask it now in Christ's name for his glory, honor, and praise. Amen.